Hey everyone, welcome to the recording of chapter one, sections 1.4 through 1.10. And I wanted to go ahead and go over these sections with you and talk through at a high level what these sections are about as you read the textbook to support what you're reading, what you're studying this week. So the first part of chapter one, we discussed what business intelligence is, the definition of it, how companies use it in today's business and IT climate, the important pieces of business intelligence, uh, what, what uh, pieces of business intelligence exist in certain organizations. What we're going to talk about today is setting up the tone for the rest of the course on a lot of key topics and concepts that we'll dive into further throughout the course. So this will round out chapter one, which is an introduction to a lot of what you're going to learn throughout the course. In analytics, one thing to understand is that you have to have your data structure intact. You got to make sure you have the right information in the right place available for you at the right time to conduct the analysis for a business recommendation or decision. Well, on the back end in IT, what you do is you work on a process called OLTP or online transaction processing. <clears throat> this is where you're going to gather all the different data points and data sources to understand what is important between what your company wants to evaluate and what they may want to evaluate in the future. This is where you do work with the business counterparts to identify the criteria for the data that you want for the business user to pull from to build analytics and reports and modeling and analytic uh, assessments and all that. So at the core of the OLTP process is they are operational. It's truly transactional data. It's truly one-to-one -one data. It's where you capture the information period. OK, and there are a variety of databases that this involves. It can be an ERP system in supply chain, capturing order management information. It could be fulfillment information, supply chain units and inventory. Other things like CRM, OK, CRM, a customer relationship management database where it has more customer insights about the profile of the customer, who they are, their demographics. And, and it's also a marketing database as well. <clears throat> The goal of all of this is to ensure that you have the right systems in place, the, but the right infrastructure and architecture to build out these data points and to collect the information. At the end of the day, it's collecting the information, having processes to collect it, but also to ensure the data has integrity, it's pure and accurate. Then you also have the online analytical processing or OLAP process. <clears throat> this is where you warehouse the data. This is where you maintain all of the ingestion of data from the OLTP process into the data warehouses that you want to house the information, but also sort the information in a manner that helps the business user go in and pull the information. It's more of the front end approach. Think about OLTP as being the back end, the ingestion of all the different data points and management of that, where OLAP is more of the front end, what information do we want at our disposal from a reporting and analytics suite perspective to pull from and then run analytics to make effective decisions. So that is the relationship between OLTP and OLAP. It's truly the relationship between the back end and front end of everything you need from data, but truly using the data for analytics. This all goes back to purely the intent for business intelligence in analytics period. It's to establish a great connection between IT and business for appropriate planning and alignment with the business strategy. So if you're in the planning and execution phase of any business strategy or business plan, you have to ensure that all of these interaction points and dependent departments are interacting and are in sync. The business, the organization, the OR functionality and the infrastructure of those reporting systems. So what are the functions served by BI Competency Center? Some companies call this a center of excellence. Some call it a BI Competency Center. Some call it, you know, a um, a stakeholder forum, whatever that means, what it really means is you're establishing the best practices for your organization to not just gather the information and the data that's important to your company, but also how to maintain it, warehouse it, manage it long term, and also use it for effective business planning. It's how business intelligence, business intelligence is linked to strategy and execution of a strategy. What we've always had at our disposal is reporting for many years in business, right? But what we've seen is a shift in culture of a lot of companies and the need for the IT counterparts to not only give us the advocation of how they can architecture the data and 
get it ready for a business user, but also have a seat at the table when it comes to being a stakeholder in the business planning phase and the execution of a strategy. They can help dictate the vision for the business, how to uh, influence a decision based on how the data comes in and how they can report on it. It's encouraged to have interaction between the potential business user communities and the information systems organization. It's very good upfront to survey and evaluate with the business user what information is important to them, how often they need it, and in what, what format, okay? That's gonna go a long way as you develop new strategies and new business plans because the foundation is already there with that relationship and that communication and synergy between IT or information systems teams and the business. This BI Competency Center or Center of Excellence also serves as a repository and disseminator of best BI business practices between and among the different lines of business. What it does, it provides governance and a committee forum, if you will, on how business intelligence can interact with multiple departments. Because different departments may need insights and you know, business intelligence or analytics for different reasons. But what they all have in common is how do you get that information? How do you communicate that with a BI team internally? And like I said, it provides that standards of excellence in BI practices that can be advocated and encouraged throughout the community. That's why you're also reading articles about why CIOs or chief information officers to champion big data and analytics and business intelligence. It's because we can advocate the need to use business intelligence and analytics to drive business decisions, but we also need to support that relationship on the back end with IT. So one thing that's at our disposal is real-time on-demand business intelligence, and it's, it's definitely attainable. We have a lot of information at our disposal in real time to measure real time performance of anything in business. But what you wanna make sure though is that you understand what is important to your company and you invest into the right areas. You don't wanna necessarily have too much information that you can't use it. You don't wanna have a shortage of information and reporting of real time analytics to not give you the right amount of insight. You find that balance and it evolves. You learn over time. It depends on your business strategy and, and overall organizational goals. What you establish though is a fundamental baseline of what time, what real time reporting you want. Okay, you justify that need, right? You invest into the technology, into the resources to develop it, and then you understand it over time. Does this work or not work? Okay. You may partner with third party providers in this as well. Sometimes the data that you ingest isn't all internal for your company. So it's also where does the external environment of third party data sources involve with not only that process for getting the information and getting that data, but also how to build out that real-time BI perspective. What matters to your company is different than other companies, even in the same industry. You may look at things in real time, maybe on a daily basis, or even maybe for marketing an hourly basis. But what it comes down to is what is important to your company. You define that and you build those business roles from a reporting perspective with business intelligence. So there are critical things to consider when building your BI system, okay? What's really important is to understand you want to develop, it, develop this internally, as in build your own homegrown BI reporting suite and data warehouse, or do you go acquire a company that's already doing it, technology out there that's already doing it? There's several questions to consider. One is justifying why you wouldn't want to develop your own. Developing your own may save money because you can actually build it and not have to pay the extra fees and licensings and all that with a technology provider. You may also have a skill set internally to do it, and you may want to be able just to manage your own data internally without the need for a third party provider. But then there's also the cost aspect, right? If, or, or perhaps you're also a business like a startup or a business that doesn't have the resources, the time, or just wants to use a third party because they have the expertise to come in, use your data, and build out a reporting suite that works for you. You need to look at is cost, the cost benefit analysis. Well, the long-term return on investment for buying a third-party, you know, technology provider, BI provider, give us more insights faster, get us up to speed quicker, so we can make actions with our analytics to return onto the business value quicker, or will the internal development cost us more time? Will it uh, also not provide the ROI that we need from, from the, what we can do in, internally versus what a reporting suite can do? So these are just things that you have to ask yourself. So it's very challenging to understand what makes sense, but you will evaluate it and make a decision as a company. But no matter what, whether you do this in-house, right, developing your own BI system or acquiring one, you have to make sure it's secure. There's a protection of privacy and it can integrate with other systems. 
obviously security and protection of privacy makes sense. There's a lot of confidential information that you want to make sure it doesn't get, you know, easily, you know, hacked into or, you know, leaked or whatever, that it's very secure and you have very secure controls on who access, accesses the information and who doesn't. But also BI tools definitely interact with other elements of other systems. Think about e-commerce. How do you get the e-commerce, you know, sales information, customer behavior metrics of a website into a BI tool if you can't if you can't connect your e-commerce platform to that? So a BI tool is going to be a nucleus of different systems that feed it, right? So you want to make sure that it integrates easily or as easy as possible with those external applications. All right, so now we're going to talk about analytics, right? It's just very straightforward. What is it? Well, we know what it is overall. It's a relatively new term, buzzword. It's been around for a while. You analyze something, but from a business perspective and organizational culture, analytics has shifted in how it's actually perceived and used. You know, before reporting was thought to be as just analytics, right? Analytics is just providing a report. Here's the report with numbers. What it does is you're taking it a step further. You're telling a story with the data. You're saying, here's what the data shows, the report shows, but here's what some additional insights can do for you on a business recommendation or as a business decision maker, they're actionable decisions or recommendations that you can use from historical data. Now, historical data is a time and place. I'll talk more about that in a little bit, the difference between that and predictive. According to the Institute of Operations Research and Management Science, or INFORMS, analytics re represents the combination of computer technology, management science techniques, and statistics to solve real problems. So analytics is more than just reporting out what happened. It's a science. It's taking variables, insights, going, almost like I said, telling a quantitative story with qualitative data at times or envisioning a trend of what is occurring based on different factors. It provides directional insights. It's not always black and white. Analytics can have a gray area to it, right? And that's what this is all about. There's three types of analytics, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Descriptive is what we're gonna spend a lot of time in chapter two talking about, and these build upon each other. Descriptive is really building a foundational approach to your information that you have today based on historical information. Now, historical could just be the day before or a couple hours ago, but it's a point in time, it's evaluating you know, business reporting, dashboards, scorecards, everything to make sure you have the trend up until that point in time. And you establish what is going on based on that point in time and before, okay? So it's well-defined business problems and opportunities. But what occurs though is, how do you take that and make it more forward-looking, right? So we're gonna spend a good amount of time in this class talking about predictive analytics. And predictive analytics is more, how do you take the historical information, use some statistical models and, and analytic um, either systems or methods to talk about what could happen next based on this trend, what will happen or what could happen, right? Kind of foreseeing the future based on history, right? And then what you do with that is you make recommendations to either say we want to go with that trend or we want to pivot the potential outcome based on what this analysis is telling us. And through that process, you have enablers of, of ways to do it with data mining, text mining, okay? It's really big data focused. It's getting into the, the, the details even more with your historical data. It's building out predictive models on scenarios and what occurred and why it occurred potentially and using outcomes that are more forward thinking than just reactive. So in business, we want to be more proactive than reactive, right? We want to get ahead of it. We want to be strategic and do better than our competition. Well, this is where if you have robust predictive analytical processes in your company, this is where you do that. And you provide more accurate projections of future events and outcomes, right? You can help forecast what happens. And it's not just forecasting revenue or sales. It's not just forecasting supply and demand and supply chain. That's part of it. But it can also forecast the outcomes of consumer behavior. You know, maybe in marketing, it's about how many more people will sign up for this advertisement or resonate with this marketing campaign, stuff like that. Once you go from predictive, then it's prescriptive. It's another step further. Okay. It's truly a providing a statistical score on a potential outcome and recommendation of what to do. It's giving you even more of a focused statement on this is where you should take the business recommendation. It provides the best possible business decisions and actions or recommendation. Okay. So it takes, it takes a step further 
of deeper diving into the insights. It also offers you the opportunity to build out models of optimization, simulation, exercises, decision modeling. There's various systems that allow you to take all this and use statistical methods in data science to build these out. Now, we're not gonna go through every single type of data science model out there in this course. We will, we will touch on some. We will talk at some at a high level. We will also talk about the culture aspect of an organization and using you know, technology to help with that information, but how business users still need to have control over those systems. So again, descriptive analytics. This is what we're gonna talk about more in chapter two, and we'll dive into more of these areas through that. But in a very introductory aspect, it's very much reporting what has occurred, right? Providing a snapshot in time. It does answer the question of what happened, and it's a retrospective analysis of historical data. The predictive and prescriptive analytics of the more forward thinking and more decision point analytics are no good if your foundation of descriptive isn't intact. That's why it's very important to, to learn the, the fundamental structure of descriptive analytics, foundational reporting, to ensure that you can build upon that for the nether layers of analytics okay, and the deeper types of insights you're looking for. So the enablers and the way to make this happen is that process we talked about of the right data structure on the back end and communicating with those business users on the front end. It's building out the, the, the right way to visualize the data with dashboards and scorecards. And overall, how do you measure performance based on your current real-time information from a historical perspective? So what is predictive analytics? That's a step further like I talked about. It aims to determine what is likely to happen in the future, foreseeing future events. It's not always 100% accurate, but it has a good statistical variance of it probably could happen or is likely to happen, or in fact, and in many cases will happen based on history and based on a, a methodology to say this is what could happen next. For example, if you have a trend of customers coming to your web, a website and there's a thousand visitors a week on average for four weeks, and you try to do a new campaign to grow that visitor count the next week, and based on history, you've seen a 10 to 20% increase in traffic because of a similar campaign, that's gonna tell you that, yeah, you may raise your new users from 1,000 to up to 1,200 with that 10 to 20% increase. Now that's pretty basic, but there's other variables that could be, could be considered to talk about predictive outcomes, okay? Other scenarios too, this is where you take more variables than just one or two. You talk about a wide variety of variables in the analysis set. And that's where the data mining comes in. You come in there and you actually build out models of different variables that can trigger, it, trigger the potential outcomes, but also influences the variables and influence the potential outcome as well. The prescriptive, once you kind of have that model built of descriptive analytics and a descriptive fundament, fundamental reporting structures, and then you take that over into predictive, the next thing you can do is say, all right, don't just tell me what could happen. Tell me with a very, very finite potential that I can believe based on statistical models, what is really the targeted solution here and potential outcome? Again, nothing's 100%, but you can get to a 99% accuracy rate, depending on the, the particular strategy you're doing, if you have the right analytics built. So it aims to determine the best possible decision to get as close to that target as possible. And you're using both the fundamentals of descriptive and prescriptive to create those alternative outcomes, but also this determines the best one. With both descriptive and predictive analytics, you can build options A, B, and C, plan A, plan B, whatever, options if you will. This is gonna tell you though, between option A, B, and C, the advocation and the recommendation is you go with this option. A, for example, or B. This is going to tell you more finite why and with statistical methods, but also um, values that will show results of reasons why. Okay. And there's a variety of methods that do this for, like I said, optimization, simulation. And we'll talk more about these in detail throughout the class later on when we talk about prescriptive analytics, what they mean, how to operate within those. Multi-criteria decision, um, decision modeling and heuristic programming. Analytics applied to many domains. What this means is that this is where you're going, to be, you're going to pull in multiple viewpoints to build out that potential prescriptive outcome. It's going, to, it's going to take in consideration the various potential viewpoints based on the data to give a very focused uh, thing or recommendation to, to run with in the business. 
the last thing down here says analytics or data science. Thinking about analytics is more of the operational approach to provide great insights and recommendations where data science is a step further and more statistical in nature. It's a little bit deeper in the analytics to develop de deeper modeling with some of these types of analytics. So they're both really similar, but it also depends on how your organizational structure is structured on how much insights is used between a business, uh, a business analyst team versus a data science team and what information they own and what they analyze. So here's an example of a retail department, right? Or a retail store and what we call a value chain. A value chain is basically the interdependent departments that all interact with each other at some point to provide the ultimate, you know, from back into front end value to the customer. So in this aspect, it starts with the vendor community for products, right? Think about the products that you buy at a retail store start somewhere. Where does it start? Where does it originate? Well, it starts with the vendor community. The vendors are the ones that are providing the supply, the brands, right? Um, and they're the ones that work with the planning department to say, here's how much supply we need. Here's the products we want. And here's the volume we want, right? Then over here is merchandising. Merchandising is going to say, all right, we do want to buy that amount of product. This is what it's available from the vendor. This is what they, they're marketing to us. They're, they're proposing we buy. Then the merchandising team goes to the buying team and says, let's buy it. Here's the stores it's going to go to. Let's plan, you know, for the rollout and marketing campaign, all that. It goes to logistics, you know, to warehouse the information. And then the multi-channel operations, the actual execution of the products in stores, online, wherever else they're going to, they're going to merchandise the product, right, or present it. And at the end of the day, it's for our customers, okay? Each one of these departments, each interact with each other in a kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, machine, right, in a process to get that product to the, the, the end customer. So, but from the back end to the front end, what happens is each of these departments have different ways they need the analytics. They have different things they look at. You know, supply chain or the planning department, excuse me, can we look at forecasting? How much does it cost? You know, how much demand do we need? Whereas the warehouse is all about inventory management. Where are we going to flow the merchandise and distribute it? Buying is looking at cost and what does the, the profitability look like? So all those different things, and you can read this, is the different types of analysis and or data variables they need. What has to happen, though, is that a unique identifier and a data, let's call this a product. A product is going to live across the entire ecosystem, right? From when it's negotiated and bought and distributed in the warehouses and sent to the field, the stores, and then bought by customers. Well, internally at the company, you need one common identifier for that product, and it could be called a product ID. Maybe that data, data variable is called a parent product ID. You know, I worked in retail for a while, so they call it different things. But what has to happen is that common, and it's a very basic example, but that common identifier has to live across the entire ecosystem. Because if you call a product one thing in one, you know, uh, set of reporting and one set of analytic database, and it doesn't speak the same language in the data set from another, that's going to cause confusion internally and actually doesn't streamline the operational approach altogether. So what has to happen is the BI team needs to understand at an enterprise level, at an organizational level, what is the most common things that everybody needs to have? And then how do I build out reporting suites or help support the data reporting viewpoints that each of these different teams need or analytic capabilities for their own purposes? That's what it's all about. So examples, like I said, inventory optimization, they care about how many products are in high demand, what products are slower moving, how do I optimize in my inventory, right? So the value of analytics that it brings, price elasticity, I care more about in buying and merchandising, the price of the product, the profitability. So I need other strategies here to manage pricing. Market basket analysis, what's being bought with what? You know, this can help determine from marketing how to you know, market two products together to make sure people buy, for example, not just the laptop, but they also buy the, the the monitor, right, to, to build that basket. So again, these are just examples, but this is where it goes back to at the core of it though, business intelligence needs to be able to service all these different business departments and needs for the business. All right, a brief introduction to big data analytics, and we're gonna dive way in more of this into the class, but at a, in a nutshell, it's about the fact that big data is data that cannot be stored or processed easily using traditional means. Big data typically refers to data that comes in many different forms. It's large, it's structured, it's unstructured, unstructured, excuse me, 
And there's three key V's to remember, three V's, volume, variety, and velocity. As we talked about at our disposal now, both internally in our company and externally with third-party providers and other data sources, there are so many opportunities to get so much information given to us about our customer, about our business, about our market research, our industry, whatever. So it comes in, it comes in fast, it comes in, but we have to just be able to manage it, right? And understand what's important, okay? It's kind of diving through all that data and understanding, all right, out of all this information, what are the sources of truth? What data sources do we trust? What do we need on a regular basis? And what is going to be the rules of engagement, if you will, around using this information? So that's very important. So data, big data or otherwise, is worthless if it does not provide business value. And for it to provide value, it has to be analyzed. So in chapter seven, down the road, we will talk more about this. But everything you learn up until that point will be about the purity and use of analytics from a fundamental perspective in the different pillars of descriptive, predictive, and, and um, per, excuse me, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. But the other layer of that is when you get a lot more information given to you, how to use those in analytical methods with that big data perspective, okay? So we're going to talk about the ecosystem, actually, but just so you know, actions, excuse me, this is more about what, who are the key players in the analytics ecosystem? So beyond just, you know, um, beyond just the architecture and building it out, who does what is the key thing, right? So you have providers. Who supports and provides the data and the information? <clears throat> do you have third party? Is it internal? What role do they play in influencing your data structure? Okay. Also, who are the stakeholders of your data governance? Where in IT and what positions and what individuals and business oversee the data governance piece to ensure it's the right information? Okay. The job opportunities, you know, what kind of types of analysts do you need? At what level do you need, you know, certain levels of experience versus entry level? Can, do you need a, a combination of both? That's what it's all about. And then understand the landscape and the future of computerized um, decision points with this too. Like how much of AI, artificial intelligence, are you going to use uh, for your business, all right? for potential um, use, use cases on your data, okay? So the difference between just, you know, running artificial intelligence and all the algorithms through a system, it's also what types of business users do you need to oversee that? So like I talked about, the back end is all these providers, right? Like we just talked about, but all the other areas that help ingest the data. And there's a lot of work to be done in each of these different bubbles to ingest that information, connect it, make sure it's you know, got the right information, it's being fed correctly. Like middleware, for example, is one where it's so much, uh, the information's coming in in one format, or the characters are coming in a certain way, or the, the how that is labeled. Middleware filters that and transposes that into how you want it into your database. And then there's also everything else here around, you know, data service providers, working with them on ingesting the information, stuff like that. This middle part here is where you talk about the actual way to govern the data. Okay, having the right industry analysts or the influencers of the information, the right certifications, the right developers, the right policy makers, everybody who has kind of a governance oversight of once we get the information in and how to manage that information and data from the outside, here's the governance approach and the decision making points between IT and business, of what information is valid and what do we need and all that. Then at the end of the day, it's the nucleus of how do we allow, allow the analytics user to provide value to the organization. Okay. So these are all these we just talked about, right? All the different providers that are out there, each one of these have a set of team members that oversee it, that manage it, that program it, that develop it, right? And then at the end of the day, it's all about providing the right forum to use the information. And just things to look at, right? When it comes to who are, who can kind of oversee as a stakeholder the information. We want to have people who are equipped, who are certified with systems and and uh, developing the software or maintaining the, the database. You wanna have individuals trained on analytic systems and also business users certified in analytical tools. Certifications are great, also the degrees that are out there. You wanna have people trained obviously and equipped to handle it because that'll make the sustainability and long-term approach and use of analytics, uh, you know, ensure it's sustainable, right? And you have to make that decision on what type of analytics is important to your company and what kind of talent do you need to support it? 
So that's an overview of analytics, very, very brief overview of a lot of topics we're going to dive in further into this book. We'll spend a lot of time on descriptive analytics for a little while, prescriptive and predictive, get into big data, and also talk more about it. in this class, what is it about when it comes to a managerial mindset? How does IT support business strategy? And what types of decisions need to be made from an IT perspective to help support business vision? Thank you for your time, and I do appreciate it. And we'll catch up in chapter two.